Nissan has gone all out to keep this third generation Qashqai ahead of an increasingly competitive chasing pack in the volume brand part of the mid-sized family SUV segment. So it's smarter, classier, cleverer, quieter, better equipped and more sophisticated. British designed and built, this one's going to take some knocking off the number one spot. Today, our roads are full of crossover models, compact family-sized SUV-style hatches that blend the practicality of a family five-door with the lifestyle looks of a 4x4. Now, Nissan didn't invent this concept, but they've done more than any other brand to perfect it, most notably with this car, the Qashqai. And in its latest third-generation form, this car has been rejuvenated, as we're going to see. It's strange now to think what a gamble this model line seemed to represent when the first generation version of this design was originally launched back in 2007. Nissan had to make it work because they had no alternative conventional focus sized hatch to sell. And they did. Sales took off and continued strongly with a second generation model launched in 2014, then heavily updated in 2017. Today, the mid-sized family SUV sector is crowded with rivals from just about every brand. Small wonder given that Qashqai-sized crossovers now make up 15% of the European market and their share continues to grow at the expense of family hatchbacks and estates. Commentators like us still often call this segment the Qashqai class, referencing Nissan's invariable sales leadership within it. But times are changing. Is the original still the best? The brand wants us to think so and has loaded this larger, smarter, sharper looking Mark III Qashqai model with all of its latest tech to make sure. Like its predecessors, the third generation J12 version of this Nissan is as much a British product as any modern car these days ever is. As before, it's built in the UK. The Japanese company's UK plant in Sunderland has produced over 3 million Qashqai's since the original was introduced. Plus, it was designed at the brand's styling studio in Paddington and engineered at its technical centre in Cranfield. Nissan says this J12 series version is much better to drive, offers more space, is more efficient and is even better smelling. Yes, really. Will all that be enough to keep it as king of the mid-size crossover segment? You'll need Car and Driving's video review, the industry's most complete test, to find out. Despite its family-friendly brief, the Nissan Qashqai has always been quite fun to drive and the changes made here suggest it ought to continue to be. Fundamentally, this is down to the introduction of this car's new common modular family CD platform, which has provided for a body shell that's 48% stiffer and made a major contribution to a weight-saving campaign that's seen this larger model shed 60 kilos compared to its slightly smaller predecessor. You don't always feel changes like that with new cars these days, but you can here. Rather unusually, in a class where driving enjoyment tends not to be prioritised, this Nissan immediately feels a little more agile and eager than your average mid-sized SUV, an impression aided by the introduction of a quicker steering rack. Which is about as far as you can go towards sportiness with a car of this kind, given that customer priorities with family crossovers usually tend to lie elsewhere. Primarily with comfort, helped here by the way the stiffer body shell allows the suspension to be a little softer than before, only bigger bumps causing thuds to be felt in the cabin. If you hadn't briefed yourself on this model before driving it, you might conclude from this that Nissan had adopted the more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension system you'll find on this car's Korean rivals. But no, that setup only makes an appearance on Qashqai variants hardly anyone will choose. Four-wheel drive derivatives or range-topping Tecna Plus versions on big 20-inch wheels. 
Everyone else who buys or leases this car will get it with a straightforward torsion beam rear axle setup we're trying here. Lightly embellished with a new upper body insulator which reduces vibrations and an uprated bump stop for the greater protection from shocks we referenced earlier. The engine bay's been lightly embellished too with a sprinkling of 12 volt mild hybrid electrification for the 1.3 litre DIGT four cylinder petrol engine almost everyone will choose in this car now that diesel's been dumped from the lineup. Mild hybrid tech, just to remind you, doesn't create any sort of proper Prius like petrol electric power plant. Instead, it's a cheap way to make existing engines, in this case the one used by final versions of the previous generation model, fractionally more efficient, courtesy of a small lithium ion battery that gives a tiny bit more mid range punch and takes care of engine stop start duties. Not that you can feel much extra mid-range urge here. This engine comes in 140 or 158 PS states of tune. And even though we've selected the higher output version for this test with 260 rather than 240 Newton meters of torque, pulling power is in short supply. So overtakes will have to be carefully planned. You'll certainly need to be using this little rocker switch near the gear stick to select the most urgent of the three provided drive modes, predictably called Sport. The other two are Standard and Eco. If you do, the stats suggest that in a DIGT 158 PS cash car like this, 62 miles an hour from rest will take 9.5 seconds en route to 128 miles an hour. For the base DIGT 140 PS model, the official readings are 10.2 seconds and 122 miles an hour. Figures that seem perfectly acceptable on paper, but this is an engine that in practice seems as if it would be a little better suited to a slightly smaller breed of SUV. Nevertheless, we think it'll suit the majority of Qashqai folk perfectly well. Nissan reckons this 1,332cc unit covers the needs of 85% of customers in this segment. Those who need more have the alternative of talking to their dealership about another gutsier, more sophisticated, but inevitably pricier option in the form of the brand's e-power self-charging hybrid drivetrain. This is a proper hybrid. The power plant's 1.5 litre, 158 PS petrol engine is primarily there to act as a generator to charge the two kilowatt hour battery pack, which then powers an electric motor driving the wheels, which get a combined petrol electric output of 190 PS. As with all self-charging hybrids, the idea isn't to provide extended EV motion. At best, you'll only get up to a couple of miles of that, but instead use electrification to cut in and out around town, delivering diesel-like efficiency figures. Most customers, though, as we've said, will stick with this test car's conventional four-cylinder DIGT mild hybrid units, which you can have paired to an Xtronic automatic gearbox if you select the 158 PS variant and don't want to stick with the rather notchy, long-throw, six-speed manual gearbox we're trying here. For this third generation model, Nissan's decided to switch the Qashqai's auto transmission from a DCT torque converter setup to a belt-driven CVT format, an arrangement which gets you steering wheel change paddles but can be an acquired taste with some disconnection between engine speed and road speed when you accelerate, try before you buy. You have to have the Xtronic Auto Box if you're one of those super rare people who want all-wheel drive with their Qashqai. A five-mode 4x4 system upgraded for this Mark III model with a redesigned direct coupling, which sends power to the rear wheels five times faster than before when it detects front wheel slip. As before, this all-mode 4x4i setup can be set in front-wheel drive, locked with drive split 50-50 to the front and rear, or left in auto to shuttle torque backwards and forwards as required. It certainly doesn't make this crossover into any kind of off-roader. There's no significant ground clearance for a start, but it'd be nice to have in a snowy snap, or if you want to tow with this car. Nissan quotes a 1.8 ton braked towing weight for front and four wheel drive DIGT 158 PS Xtronic variants. That falls quite a lot with the manual models to just 1,040 kilos with the base DIGT 140 PS variant. 
which is all useful to know, but by and large you don't choose a Qashqai to deal with boggy trails or clumsy caravans. It's a family charabang that performs the role which probably would have been taken by a small estate or MPV a couple of decades back, doing so with a dash more style and panache, especially in this usefully improved third generation form, which now feels much more able to justify its sales leading status. One of the challenges of reinvigorating a car based on a successful formula is to get the balance of fresh and familiar just right. And this Gen 3 Qashqai might just have hit the sweet spot, incorporating some recognisable elements into a contemporary shape that's been usefully evolved. To our eyes, there's a bit of Lexus in the array of complex angles and edges, and it's certainly smoother and more sophisticated than before. Nissan uses words like athletic muscular and dynamic to describe this latest look, but then so does every other brand in this segment. You might well feel, though, that those adjectives are more suited here. At first glance, you might think it quite similar to the previous generation model, but look again. The double chrome trimmed V-motion central grille is much deeper and the upper and lower parts of the headlamps, now with the full LED variety, are separated by this colour-coded Qashqai branded trim strip. Below sit thin corner slits which channel air flow through to the wheel arches and flank a lower intake which Nissan hasn't bothered to embellish with any kind of silvered skid plate. Qashqai folk don't really need elements of SUV pretense. They might quite like front fog lights though, but you only get those on the very priciest models. At the side, the Qashqai meets the crossover fashion criteria of the moment. Floating roof, optionally available in black, tick. Kick up body line over the rear wheel arches, tick. Black cladding for the wheel arches and the lower body, tick. Yet there are also some distinctive features and clever visual tricks going on. The muscular swage line that runs from between the headlights and upwards over the top of the rear lights is quite dramatic. This rear crease angled up from the back door handle to the B pillar is interesting. And there's an angled lower cut line to give the flanks some shape. The mirrors are now mounted on the doors rather than the A pillar, a bit like they would be on a sports car. And to suit the mood of the moment, there are big wheels ranging from 17 to 20 inches in size. We've got 19 inches here. It's when viewed from behind that this J12 series Qashqai design is most restrained and perhaps most familiar, with wraparound rear lights that offer a gentle evolution from those of the Generation 2 model, now slimmer and separated by spaced out letters below the Nissan badge. There's also a prominent silver insert for the bumper, which has slim lower reflectors, and you get the usual pronounced spoiler at the top of a tailgate fashioned from composite plastic. Weight saving of that kind, together with the use of aluminium for the bonnet, front wings and doors, plus an all new CMFC Alliance platform, has helped trim curb weight by 60 kilograms this time round, which is impressive given that this Mark III Qashqai is a slightly larger car than its J11 series predecessor, 35 millimeters longer, 32 millimeters wider, and 25 millimeters taller to be precise. So it seems the Qashqai is familiar yet bang up to date. Has Nissan followed a similar approach within? Pretty much, yes. You'd feel a sense of familiarity here if you'd regularly used the previous generation model day in, day out. The logical layout, the gear shifter angle, and a seating position that's halfway between SUV and family hatch. Yet you'd also appreciate that everything's been brought up to date with smarter switch gear and a central touchscreen that sits on top of the dashboard rather than being buried into it. Softer touch materials and more sophisticated instruments seek to promote the feeling of greater luxury than you might expect from the price tag, embellished on upper spec models by classy ambient lighting and the largest head-up display in the segment. Nissan doesn't, though, think minimalistic design is luxurious 
curious. You also still get plenty of buttons and plenty of material variety too. Take for instance this diagonally stitched faux leather panel ahead of the passenger which sits above grained inlays, silver beading and textured plastic. There's plenty going on. The brand talks of the fanatical attention to detail that's gone into creating what seems like quite a familiar environment. Perhaps it's all the more impressive that you don't really notice it. Take for instance the fact that the centre screen isn't just operated by touch and voice, it also has proper physical dials and shortcut buttons. Switch from some rivals and you'll also be pleased to find that the brand hasn't been tempted to build climate functions into this monitor where they'd be fiddly to find. They're more clearly accessible on this lower centre stack panel which now includes the heated seat controls which you had to hunt around for on the previous model. A previous owner would notice that visibility is improved. That's because of the wider opening angle of the windscreen and the narrower A pillars. And a new convert might notice that you can more easily turn the high beam assist on and off with this button at the end of the indicator stalk, or that the USB ports provided in this bin between the seats are of both the USB A and USB C variety. So you don't have to faff around with converter leads. All small touches, certainly, but collectively very significant. As is this Mark III model step forward into infotainment and connectivity. Well, on most models anyway. The entry-level Vizier variant has to do without a Nissan Connect centre screen, which makes an appearance in 8-inch form in the trim level above a centre premium, and only reaches this 9-inch size, which gets you navigation, with mid-level N connector trim upwards, by which point... You may have blown your budget. Hopefully not, because it's quite sophisticated, compatible with Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa devices. Plus, there's Google Maps, a TomTom live traffic service and Wi-Fi activation. Plus, the Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring at this level is of the wireless sort. As already mentioned, functionality here is super straightforward. We talked about these lower shortcut buttons, and there's a further row of virtual ones just above. On the screen itself, from the menu starting point, swipe one way to get an analogue clock, swipe the other to access audio and navigational functions. You've also to stretch quite a way up the range to get the other screen Nissan wants to talk about in this cabin, this 12.3-inch combi meter display. The entry and medium level grades make do with traditional dials separated by a basic 7-inch screen. If you can avoid that, though, this more expansive TFT setup's worth stretching to. As usual with virtual instrument tech, you get two computer-generated dials separated by a customizable central display and also available in a funky rotated view. The right-hand speedometer gauge, which only shows in even-numbered increments, has central speed sign and digital mile per hour readouts, while the left-hand rev counter has a personal display, customizable center bezel into which you can put navigation and trip computer data. Get busy with buttons on the left-hand wheel spoke and you'll find that this kind of info can also sit between the dials along with audio, compass and eco setting readouts. What else? Well, build quality from the Sunderland plant feels very good and Nissan's even thought a lot about how this Qashqai smells inside, taking steps to ensure materials don't create any unpleasant odours as use and age gradually erode the new car aroma. That slightly raised driving position offers a good range of adjustment, both in the height adjustable seat, which also offers good support, and the great to hold reach and rake steering wheel. There's lumbar support for the driver with all but the entry grade too. We talked earlier about the better forward vision this time round. Unfortunately, your over the shoulder view isn't quite as good, restricted a little by the tiny rear quarter lights. But rear parking sensors are standard on all models. And on all but entry level trim level, you get a rear camera too, with an excellent multi camera around view monitor setup, standard from mid range N connector trim upwards. In line with its family-orientated role, the Qashqai needs to provide a practical cabin. Does it? Well, you decide. The door pockets aren't that big, the glove box turns out to be smaller than it looks, and there's no overhead sunglasses compartment or useful touches like footwell storage or underseat trays. But the basics are covered off reasonably well. So you get nice deep cup holders between the front seats, ticket clips in the sun visors, and this centre armrest cubby is satisfyingly deep providing the twin USB slots we mentioned earlier. 
This shallow tray at the base of the center stack is where the wireless charging mat of higher spec versions sits, and it has a 12 volt socket just above. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now this Qashqai's rear doors open to 85 degrees, making access very easy. And the 20 millimeter wheelbase increase over the previous generation model should mean there's extra legroom inside. Let's see. Backseat passengers should be reasonably happy here. There's 28 millimeters more legroom than in a Gen 2 Qashqai, and the headroom is up by 15 millimeters, or at least it would be on a model without this huge glass roof, which, if you can live with a slightly lower ceiling height, gives an agreeably airy feel to the interior. Six footers should just about fit, and this rear bench doesn't do anything clever like reclining or sliding as it would do in a rival Volkswagen Tiguan or Skoda Karok and you wouldn't be very comfortable sitting for any real period in the center of it, legs astride the transmission tunnel. Still, contoured seat backs and the space you get to slide your shoes beneath the front chairs make this part of the car feel reasonably spacious. Above that tunnel, you'll find the usual pair of vents, plus on plusher models, both USB-C and USB-A charging sockets. Nissan's rather meanly deleted coat hooks from the grab handles and forced the base spec version to go without these seat back pockets. But at least the door bins, while not long, are deep enough to take a larger bottle or more likely piles of Lego and crumbs. And the flip down centre armrest incorporates two cup holders. These rear quarter light windows avoid a feeling of claustrophobia. There are little clips to keep the seat belts out of the way when not in use, and white stitching gives the door cards a lift. Right, let's finish with a look at the boot. Now, the upper spec Qashqai models like this Tecna and the range topping Tecna Plus variant allow you to open the tailgate with. A foot swipe, which is very useful when you're carrying shopping, children, or both. The hatch reveals a wide and deep aperture and the lips sensibly low. Nissan has redesigned the suspension of this Mark III Qashqai, giving a useful load space capacity increase of 50 litres, providing 504 litres with all seats in place, enough to take up to seven carry-on cases. It's worth pointing out, though, that this figure falls as you ascend the range. This plush Tecna version has only 475 litres and top Tecna Plus trim, hobbled by the need to accommodate an upgraded Bose audio system, sees that figure fall to just 436 litres. If you specify four-wheel drive, you'll find that system eats into boot space too, thanks to the fact that the suspension's of a different design. Even the top capacity figure still leaves this Nissan towards the slightly smaller end of the class, roughly on par with the 510-litre trunk of a rival Seat Attica, but some way behind the 591-litre space offered by the Peugeot 3008. The plus side of spending a bit more money on trim and avoiding the first two spec levels is that you get this super useful luggage board arrangement. These two removable lower panels create a flat cargo base with a usefully sized and invisible storage area below into which the parcel shelf can fit. They can also be raised or lowered as needed or flipped upright to divide the boot space into sections and stop items sliding about. One side of them is also covered in a wipe clean surface that's ideal for putting muddy things on, such as walking boots. There's a bit of further space beneath the lower floor, though only because Nissan declines to provide a standard spare wheel. Recesses to the left and right make it easy to take wide items like golf bags widthways, and you get a bag hook on either side, the usual tie downs and a 12 volt socket on the right, but no ski hatch or useful 40-20-40 rear bench flexibility. So if you've two occupants on the back seat, longer items like skis will unfortunately have to go on the roof. It's annoying too that there are no cargo sidewall catches to help you when the time comes to flatten the 60-40 split bench. You have to go around to the side doors and pull the release catch on top of the seat backs. Once everything's retracted, up to 1,447 litres is freed up. Useful, 
but nowhere near class leading. It's around 150 litres less than you'd get in the Attica and about 220 litres less than the 3008. Again, that figure will fall on a four-wheel drive variant or with top trim to a low of 1,379 litres with the plushest Tecna Plus versions. Still, that will probably be quite sufficient for most customers. <laughs> Like its predecessors, this third generation Qashqai comes in a single five-door body style and at the time of this test in late 2021, prices were pitched from around 24 and a half to almost £39,000 spread across five trim levels. There's a single five-seat cabin format. As before, families in search of seven seats can turn to Nissan's X-Trail, which uses most of the same mechanicals, across a stretched version of the same CMF CD platform. For Qashqai folk, there's no longer a diesel option. Almost all sales instead based around the brand's 1.3 litre DIGT mild hybrid petrol engine, available in either 140 or, as in this case, 158 PS forms. The latter available with the option of Xtronic automatic transmission, now a belt driven CVT setup. Choose that auto box and you'll get the opportunity of specifying that rarest of things a Qashqai with four wheel drive. The other power plant you can talk to your dealer about is the brand's latest e-power full hybrid, which combines a 1.5 litre petrol engine with a 187 bhp electric motor. You can't plug it in, but you'll get a big boost in economy thanks to the way that the wheels are powered at all times by the electric motor and the petrol engine acts as a generator. Our focus here, though, is on the volume 1.3 litre mild hybrid DIG T models. For these, we mentioned the starting price earlier, just under £25,000. Though you'll need to bear in mind that this figure solely applies to a single base Vizier spec variant only offered with the least powerful engine mated to manual transmission, a confection few will want. In reality, it's more realistic to think of the Qashqai lineup starting from just over £27,000, with the next trim level up, a Centre Premium, which then gives you the choice of both DIGT mild hybrid engines and the option for an extra 1600 quid of the auto gearbox. Further price jumps in increments of just over £2,000 take you through the remaining trim options. N connector, Tecna, which is what we have here, and top Tecna Plus, the latter available only with the more powerful 158 PS DIGT engine. You'll need one of these three plusher options if you want to add around £1,700 to the price of a DIGT 158 PS Xtronic Qashqai and build in that four-wheel drive system we mentioned earlier. OK, so that's briefed you on the Qashqai lineup. Now, how does its value proposition compare against rivals in this segment? Well, at the time of this test in late 2021, we hadn't yet seen the French version of this Nissan Renault Alliance design, the Renault Austral. But as with earlier versions of these two models, we can expect that car to be priced and pitched very similarly to this one and targeted precisely at two Volkswagen Group models that mop up a decent percentage of sales in this sector, Seat's Attica and Skoda's Karok, two cars priced very comparably to this Nissan, as are Vauxhall's Grandland, Kia's Sportage, Suzuki's S-Cross and the Mini Countryman. Of course, you could save a bit by settling for a fractionally smaller crossover. Cars like Kia's Exceed, Mazda's MX-30 and Honda's HRV are fractionally bigger than really small SUVs, but maybe still not quite big enough to comfortably take your family. Bargain basement brand mid-size models in this segment, like Sangyong's Corando and MG's HS, will be, but you probably don't want a bargain basement brand model. In which case, you'll find that pretty much everything else we haven't yet mentioned in the mid-sized crossover class will cost you a fair chunk more than Nissan is asking here. Specifically, think from just under £30,000 as a starting point, but probably much more than that once you've got the spec and engine combination you'll need. Into this category fall cars like Ford's Cougar, Volkswagen's Tiguan, Peugeot's 3008, Citroën's C5 Aircross, Mazda's CX-5 and Hyundai's Tucson. If having considered all of this, you conclude that it is 
a cash car you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Nissan has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. We mentioned earlier that base Vizier spec might not be exactly what you might be looking for, but it does include automatic LED headlights, LED tail lamps, rear parking sensors, a 7-inch combi meter display in the instrument binnacle, manual air conditioning, a rear spoiler, a Thatcham alarm system, an engine immobiliser, a four-speaker DAB audio system, and a very complete portfolio of camera safety kit, which will brief you on in a few moments. Standard drive stuff across the range includes a selection of drive modes and intelligent cruise control, which keeps a safe distance from the vehicle in front and works with the standard traffic sign recognition system that links into a speed limiter, which when set could prevent you from exceeding the speed limit. Also built into this third generation model is an active brake limited slip system. Basically one of those torque vectoring setups that senses wheel spin, then automatically applies the brakes to the spinning wheel and directs power to the wheel or wheels with the best traction. So that's covered base Vizier spec. It'd be better though, as we suggested earlier, to try and stretch to the next trim level up, a centre premium, which gives you much more, specifically 17 inch alloy wheels, power folding mirrors, rain sensing wipers, and most of the key camera safety features missing from the entry level car. Inside, in place of the rather basic audio and infotainment arrangement of the lead in model, a centre premium variants get a proper 8 inch Nissan Connect infotainment screen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, plus a six speaker audio setup. At this level, you also get a rear view camera, dual zone air conditioning, a rear centre armrest and a leather covered steering wheel. Mid-range N connector spec models are marked out by 18 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, privacy glass and a smart silver insert for the rear bumper. Plus there are front parking sensors and Nissan's around view monitor camera system with moving object detection. More importantly, you'll need to stretch to this level in the range for the super useful luggage board arrangement for the boot and for navigation, which requires the largest 9-inch Nissan Connect touchscreen. Other N connector features include wireless Apple CarPlay functionality, smarter anthracite upholstery, an auto dimming interior mirror and extra USB sockets for rear seat passengers. Techno trim, which as we mentioned earlier is what we have here, is where things start feeling plusher and a lot more sophisticated. Here you gain 19 inch alloy wheels, roof rails and a hands-free power tailgate. Plus the headlights feature an adaptive driving beam which can split the high beam into 12 individually controlled segments to give better illumination without dazzling others. The inside will look different too with Technic spec, thanks to the addition of a super sharp 12.3 inch combi meter digital instrument cluster screen, together with a 10.8 inch head up display. The seats take an upgrade thanks to leather and cloth upholstery, front heating and eight way power adjustment for the driver's chair, whose lumbar adjustment feature is also duplicated by the front passenger seat at this level. There's also heat for the steering wheel and windscreen, a wireless charging mat, ambient lighting and you get a full length glass roof. For Qashqai Tecna spec models equipped with the Xtronic CVT automatic transmission, the Pro Pilot driver aids use navigation data to operate more smoothly by anticipating upcoming things like bends and speed limit changes. At the top of the trim tree is Tecna Plus, which gains 20 inch alloy wheels, LED front fog lamps and gives you toys such as quilted leather seats with a three mode massage function for those up front, plus four way electric lumbar support for both front seats. There's an uprated Bose sound system with 10 speakers and the vehicle key can store information about the driver's seat and mirror settings and your audio preferences. And of course, for use across the range, there's an app. There's always an app, isn't there? As usual with these sorts of applications, the Nissan Connect Services app allows you to remotely open the doors, preset the climate system, activate horn 
and lights and get guided to your car if you've forgotten where you parked it. If you lend your Qashqai out, the app can alert you if it's driven outside a preset geographic boundary or if it's driven after a certain time. Plus, you can keep track of your journeys, check tyre pressure, oil level or airbag status and conduct a vehicle health check at any time. Bear in mind, though, that the app is only provided free for the first three years of ownership. What about options across the range? Well, annoyingly, you have to pay extra for a spare wheel. Metallic paint costs extra too, of course. Or you could go for a pearlescent shade, like the magnetic blue we have here. If you want this two-tone roof offered in conjunction with five of the body colours, then you'll need to have chosen one of the top three trim levels. Other options are also only available in the upper trim echelons, including the wireless phone charging pad you can have on N connector models, the 10-speaker premium Bose sound system you could add into this Tecna spec, and LED fog lamps that are available on Tecna and Tecna Plus variants. Your dealer can also introduce you to various optional packs available across the range. A chrome elegance pack adds front, side and rear finishers. A protection pack adds mud guards, luxury floor mats and a reversible trunk liner for the boot floor. A trunk kit adds an in-car carrier and a luggage entry guard. An explorer pack adds roof crossbars, a bike carrier, a ski carrier and a roof box and a towing pack adds a tow bar. Let's finish with a look at safety. Now, a decent level of camera safety kit shouldn't be optional on a car of this price these days, and thankfully it isn't here. Hence, this car's full house, five-star Euro NCAP rating. A blue button on the right-hand steering spoke brings up a useful camera safety graphic showing the lane departure warning, blind spot warning and intelligent forward collision warning systems. The latter reinforced by intelligent front emergency braking that can recognise pedestrian, cyclists and junctions. There's also driver attention alert, which looks for signs of drowsiness and prompts the driver with an alarm and a shimmy of the steering wheel. And high beam assist to dip your headlights for you at night. With most other brands, you'd have to stretch to top trim or buy a pricey optional pack to get rear cross-traffic alert, which warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing out of a space. It's standard here, and on a Qashqai, this works with intelligent rear automatic braking, which applies the brakes if an object is detected while you're reversing. A child or a dog in your driveway, for instance. It's annoying that other makers think features like this are a luxury. Other things of note include the addition this time round of a new central airbag to support the usual twin front, side and curtain bags. And as usual on modern cars, there's an emergency and breakdown call e-call system, which alerts the emergency services with your GPS location should one of those bags go off. Plus, of course, you get the usual systems for braking, traction and stability control, along with hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and tyre pressure monitoring. Now, we mentioned traffic sign recognition earlier. Plus, as usual, in the rear, there are two Isofix child seat anchorage points with top tether fastenings. <laughs> Like many other mild hybrid powertrains, the one in this Nissan promises more than it ultimately delivers in terms of fuel economy and CO2 benefits. The figures produced by this third generation Qashqai's mild hybrid 12 volt 1.3 litre DIGT petrol units are improved, but not by very much over the equivalent power plants of the previous model. Still, at least those WLTP combined figures aren't affected very much by whether you choose the 140 or 158 PS versions of this engine. And there's no real efficiency penalty for choosing the CVT Xtronic Auto gearbox rather than the six-speed manual, though the readings do vary a little according to trim level and size of wheels. Let's get to the WLTP rated figures. Think somewhere between 43 and 45 MPG for a front-driven DIGT model like this one, giving a range of around between 520 and 550 miles. 
and a CO2 return in the 143 to 146 gram per kilometre bracket. Rival Volkswagen Group mid-sized SUVs in this segment, like Seat's Attica for instance, don't need mild hybrid tech to match or beat these stats, which gives you some idea of the basic efficiency issues Nissan was battling with in using what in essence is a rather elderly engine. As you'd expect, when you pair it with four-wheel drive, the readings take a slight dip. For that version, you're looking at bests of 155 grams per kilometre and 41.2 mpg, reducing the driving range to just under 500 miles. You might well be familiar with the way the mild hybrid electrification setup works in this four-cylinder engine, recovering energy under braking or deceleration, then storing it in a little lithium-ion battery for use in acceleration or when the car's using its stop-start system. Rival Korean brand Kia offers mild hybrid tech in this segment in concert with a diesel engine, but Nissan's moved on from black pump fueled units with this Qashqai and hopes instead to interest folk who previously might have chosen a more powerful DCI power plant with one that rather better fits the current zeitgeist. The e-power full hybrid engine in question can't be plugged in, but it is primarily battery driven, being different to some other full hybrid power plants in that the petrol engine doesn't drive the wheels, but is primarily used only to power the electric motor. Nissan says this setup can deliver better fuel economy and enhanced emissions, while also providing the instant acceleration of a pure electric car. Unlike an EV though, this powertrain can't take you very far on full battery power, just a couple of miles at most. Instead, its electrification cuts in and out around town, delivering diesel-like efficiency figures. As with Nissan's Leaf EV, the Qashqai e-Power offers e-pedal driving, whereby brake energy regeneration slows the car so much off throttle that you hardly ever need to use the brakes. Whatever engine you choose in this Nissan, the way you drive it will obviously be the biggest determining factor in the efficiency returns you ultimately get. Obviously, you'll need to frequently select the most economical of the three drive modes available, Eco, and keep an eye on the various screen tools available that rate the frugality of your driving. The instrument screen settings menu, for instance, has a view history section that graphically shows your recent and average fuel returns. That also forms part of a useful EcoDrive report that displays in the instrument cluster when you power off at the end of each journey. With the big 12.3 inch screen in place behind the steering wheel, fuel economy figures can also display in the center of the rev counter. What else might you need to know? Well, the CO2 figures we quoted earlier for the 1.3 litre DIGT engine will see company car buyers faced with a benefit in kind rate of 32 or 33% in the first year of ownership, then 33 or 34 in years two and three. Four wheel drive variants attract a BIK rate of 35% in year one and 36 in years two and three. The Qashqai is covered by a three-year or 60,000 mile warranty. That's average by class standards, but shorter than the five-year unlimited mileage warranty of the Hyundai Tucson and the seven-year 100,000 mile warranty of the Kia Sportage. Though you can pay to extend the duration or distance covered by Nissan's package. There's also breakdown assistance included from new for the first three years you own the car and for a year following each service at a Nissan dealer. In terms of servicing, the standard intervals are every 12 months or 18,000 miles, and there are a number of deals that allow you to pay monthly to cover services over a two, three or four year period. With Nissan's not faring brilliantly in previous reliability surveys, even if most problems have been minor, that's worth considering. The cost of insuring the Qashqai is reasonable with the entry level Vizier version sitting at an affordable Group 11e. Going for a better equipped Ascenta Premium or N Connector 140 PS variant only moves you up one insurance group, providing you stick to the 140 PS engine. If you upgrade to this test car's 158 PS unit, ratings sit in the 16e to 19e bracket. Finally, let's look at residual values, an area where the Qashqai has always performed reasonably well for a volume brand crossover. For this Mark III model, independent experts predict that after the usual industry standard three year or 36,000 mile ownership period, this Nissan will be worth around 52% of its original asking price, with a bit of variance depending on the variant you select. That's a decent improvement on the 46% figure recorded by the previous generation generation model.
Building a crossover vehicle is easy. Building one as good as this Qashqai is a whole lot tougher, as competitors have found. Nissan has done all the expected things in order to keep this third generation design current. Sharper looks, a degree of engine electrification, a bit more interior space. But at heart, this Qashqai offers much the same kind of family oriented crossover package, which existing customers will very much like. The deletion of diesel has made the engine range look a bit sparse, with the mainstream lineup built around the single, slightly lacklustre 1.3 litre DIGT unit we've been trying here. But driving points are regained with sharp steering, supple suspension, and agile handling that really showcases the benefits of this Mark III model's weight loss programme. With these kinds of cars, you've generally to venture quite a way up the range before you're struck with much of a feeling of luxury. But if you can do so here, this third generation design delivers it much more convincingly than its predecessors. And we're impressed that Nissan has provided a class leading standard of camera safety provision right across the lineup. So, how to summarize? Will fresh converts be attracted to this rejuvenated model? That's difficult to say. There's an awful lot of competition from an awful lot of very talented rivals out there. And the Qashqai is no longer the bargain it once was. Still, this remains a car from a brand that clearly knows its market. It's still a benchmark and it's still a starting point for anyone buying in this segment.